All right, guys, welcome back to the Counterintelligence Studio. Today we're going to be doing one of our most versatile techniques that we have that we offer in our training to our franchisees. This technique here can be done so many different ways. It's going to start out as a linear model. We're going to turn it into a wood grain, and then we're going to turn it into a different type of like a softer wood grain at the very end. At any point, you could stop during this process if you like the look that you're going for. You don't have to take this all the way to the last step that we're going to today, but we're going to show you the versatility of this technique. It's very rich. Uh, it is very dependent upon color combinations, so if you want to try this in different color combinations than what we have here today, I do recommend uh, trying it on a sample board before you try it on a project because not all colors are going to react as good as these do together. So today we're going to be using a sandbar metallic, we're going to be using a rum metallic, we're going to be using a walnut liquid and a black liquid. I like to start with my darkest color first for this uh, particular type of technique. And with this one, we're going to pour everything out in a linear fashion, just like we're going for a wood grain. There's a lot of marbles that are straight and kind of linear like this anyway. You have some options when it comes to pouring these lines out. If you want really big color changes throughout your top, you're going to want to pour larger sections of each individual color. If you want your color to be more consistent from this side of the board to that side of the board or countertop, you're going to want to be much more uniform with the way that you pour it. So for this one, I might do a couple of big spots, but for the most part, we're going to be pretty uniform with how we're going to pour out our colors. Okay, so black is a color that will dominate any technique or any color very, very easily. But black reacts pretty good with just about any other color that you want to put with it. So you see I poured out some heavier spots of black. They're not super heavy, but I'm, I'm then going to take the stick and I'm just going to drizzle just small amounts of black. I want a little bit of black pretty much everywhere on this board because it really adds a lot of depth in your other colors for techniques like this. It just really reacts well with all the metallics and the other liquids as well. We're now going to move into our walnut liquid. We're going to pour much heavier, bigger spots with the walnut than we did with the black. But again, I'm going to try to be pretty uniform with the amount of walnut from one side of the piece to the other. I'm just pouring it heavier than I did the black. I apologize if you guys hear a little bit of background noise. We got some construction going on out in the warehouse today. So we'll try to drown that out as best we can in the video. But just go ahead and point it out in case you hear it going on in the background. My apologies. Okay, that's good enough for the walnut. Now we're gonna move into our first metallic color, which is our rum metallic. Very much like we did with the walnut liquid. We're gonna be pouring it in decently heavy areas, pretty evenly distributed throughout the entire piece. I'm not necessarily trying to avoid the other colors when I pour them out. Um, you just kind of just have a little bit of fun whenever you're pouring out your colors. It doesn't have to be, you really don't want a pattern to the way that you're pouring this out. You just want to be very random. You want some to be heavier than others. You want some skinny spots, some short spots, some long lines. You just want to vary it as best you can. And this color here, rum, is one of the prettiest and most um, interactive metallics that we have. So I like to use pretty much every single drop of the, the uh, rum that I have in the cup every time I pour it out. So typically with this process, you need about three ounces per square foot. I mix up about three and a half to four ounces per square foot because I don't always use every bit of every color that I have. Once 
I see that I have enough black in here, I'm gonna stop putting the black down. Once I see I have enough walnut, I'm gonna stop putting the walnut down. So I, I just recommend mixing a little bit more than you want because as you're starting to put it down, you'll find out, you know, like, dang, I don't wanna use quite that much black or you, you don't wanna to have to use every single ounce that you mixed up because if you want to cut back on a color you want to have that ability to do so without having to go and mix up more epoxy. So just mix up for this technique in particular a little bit more than you actually need to get your coverage. It just gives you a little bit of flexibility when you're pouring out your pieces. You will appreciate that tip later on when you start doing it yourself. So we've got all of our colors on the board. So this is a very, very simple, easy technique to do. We're going to just use our hand. We're going to lay our fingers pretty flat. We're not going to use the palm of our hand. We're going to use our fingers, but we're going to lay them flat. We're not combing our fingers yet. We will later on. Okay, so we're just going to lay our, our fingers kind of flat. We're using very light pressure, and we're just starting to mix these colors together. Okay. I'm not going to overwork these colors. My primary objective right now is just to get the board covered with the epoxy. I don't want to have any dry spots left on this board when I'm done. So one thing that you might think, oh, I need to be perfectly straight with the way I'm moving my hand, but that's not the case. With this, you want to vary the stroke of the epoxy, but you definitely want to avoid making arcs with your hand. So I like to just kind of purposely create these little gentle S curves throughout the epoxy with this striated look. Uh, and in some areas, I'll try to be really nice and straight. But I, again, I don't want to get too patterned and too uniform with how I'm doing this. Okay, so once you get everything spread out, you're going to want to go around your edges. If you have finished edges on a countertop, you know the drill from training. And if you come into training, you know, we, we have an extensive way that we handle our faces to ensure that they turn out great every single time. But for a sample board, this is just a half inch thick piece of MDF. We just want to get a little bit of epoxy on there just so it'll flow over and look natural when we're done. Okay, so I'm just looking for any kind of dry spots right now, any voids, any little areas that I missed. Okay, looking pretty good. So Chris, if you want to come in here and go ahead and get them a shot of what this looks like up close right now, you can see that the different pigments, we have two metallics and two liquids. Those pigments are, the difference of the pigment is keeping the colors pretty well separated. You can see a definite uh, definition between the, the sandbar metallic and the rum metallic, the black liquid and the walnut liquid. We have very hard contrast between all of those colors. So right now, at this point, you'll see some air bubbles in the epoxy which have zero effect on what we're trying to accomplish at this particular junction. When we spray this with isopropyl alcohol, if you're trying to achieve a marble effect, you're gonna leave it alone at that point. So. If you're going for a marble look and you have anything in here that you really hate, let's just say you poured a real heavy swipe of walnut and it just looks too plain. You want to go ahead and run your fingers through that again before you hit it with isopropyl or a stick or anything that you want. Uh, just make sure in general the color distribution looks about how you want it to look in your marble before you spray it with the isopropyl. You can still ad adjust it after the isopropyl but it just, it works best if you can get it done before you hit it the first time with the isopropyl. All right, so here we go. This is always the fun part. So I'm barely hitting the trigger, so I get some large and some small isopropyl drops coming out of my, my bottle. So now you can quickly see, obviously we have a lot of circles created by the isopropyl alcohol, but you can see how it fractures the colors. 
And now instead of this just looking like stripes, when the isopropyl evaporates out of here, it's really gonna look like a piece of marble. It really is. Uh, this is a very popular technique. This has been one that when we show it at home shows and stuff, a lot of people really like this technique. It's, it's very dynamic. The color definition is very strong in this one because you don't overwork it whatsoever. So you can definitely stop at this point right here and you have a very nice finished product. If you are going to stop at this point, you're going to want to give your isopropyl a few minutes to evaporate and then torch it to help release any of the remaining trapped air bubbles and then you're good to go. Just address your faces and your edges, make sure everything stays looking good. Okay, we're going to give this just a second uh, and that's just to let the isopropyl evaporate just a little bit and then we're going to go to phase two of what you can do with this technique. So we've spread this out with our hand and sprayed it with isopropyl alcohol. And that is the way you can get a marble effect with this technique. Now we're gonna take it into phase one of a wood grain technique that you can do. All this requires is now we're gonna comb the same direction that we used our hands. We're gonna comb it with our fingers. And what it's gonna do is gonna tighten up that grain and since we've already sprayed it with isopropyl alcohol, it's going to naturally create some little spots that look like natural knots in the wood. Okay, so we're just going to kind of create a comb with our fingers. And we're going to work back and forth. I like to go both directions in each section. I don't want to overwork the product, but I feel like if I only go through one time, it just looks like I ran my fingers through it. But if I go through it two times, both directions, it gets a much more natural looking wood grain to it when we're done. So now I'm gonna go ahead and finish out the exact same technique, just varying the direction and the the slight motion of my hands, just enough to make it look natural. Okay, so now at this point, you can do a few different things if you wanna add a little bit of extra uh, pizzazz to this. Uh, you might have seen in some of our other videos where we've done accent colors into the, to the wood grains. You could take a little bit of spray paint, maybe put some white lines in here, which are going to contrast really hard. You could put a blue in here, a green, any kind of color that you want to, to make it kind of pop and stand out. Because if you use spray paints and you put them in with a stick and spread them out, it's going to follow the same contour that the epoxy is doing with our hands, but it's going to stay really skinny and they're going to, the paint's going to float on top of the epoxy. It's going to make this really hard contrasting color. So I think I'm going to show you all real quick with a little bit of white. So we don't want to use a whole lot and we don't want to put it everywhere. We're just going to make a few spots. This is supposed to be an accent, not a main color. So we don't want to get too crazy. I'm kind of targeting some of my darker spots with this. So once I get an amount I'm happy with into the epoxy, I'm gonna put the paint away and I'm gonna clean my stick because I don't wanna get any more paint into the epoxy than I already wanted. So I'm gonna take a stick and I'm gonna work that paint in the same kind of direction and way that I did with my fingers. And this is gonna create very nice, subtle, but very definitive hard lines of white. And you could use any color that you want to but the white's just gonna give a nice hard contrast to the other colors that we have in this piece. This is definitely not a step that you have to make with this technique, but it is one that you can make with this technique. And it does create a cool effect into a wood grain. And as far as working the, the paint into the epoxy, there is no exact right amount or uh, anything like that as far as how much you work it. If you start working the paint in, you'll, you'll see it kind of disappear. And a lot of people panic. They're like, oh, I just got rid of it. And they'll start pouring more and more paint in here. 
the paint's going to float to the surface, I promise you. It's going to float back to the surface. And you want it to be an accent, not a hard color. So if you like this look for the wood look, this is just going to be a nice kind of a tight grain. You can see some of the isopropyl has kind of created these circles, which is going to kind of, when this thing's all said and done, it's going to kind of look like some natural knots. Do not hit this again with isopropyl if you're going to leave it like this with this technique. If you hit the wood grain with isopropyl, it's going to look more like a marble again, just a tighter grain marble than it does wood. Okay, so you want, with a wood, you want to hit it prior to combing with your fingers versus afterwards, and it just looks more natural that way. Okay, so just so you can see really truly what this should look like when it's done. I'm going to go ahead and torch this just to get rid of the bubble so you can get a nice clean picture of what it should look like at this point if you're going to leave it alone. Here at Counterintelligence, we're a little bit different than the other epoxy companies that you see on YouTube. Um, we cater, we offer franchise opportunities to our customers. We also offer these videos to the general public, so you can see, I mean, we're, we're, these are no great secrets as far as application goes. There's a lot of talent on YouTube that can show you how to do epoxy. The difference between Counterintelligence and other companies are, we teach you the entire business. We teach you how to get customers, how to land customers, how to retain customers, how to do your social media marketing, how to um, you know, manage your books, everything. We are a one-stop shop. And we have a lot of proprietary products that are not going to be available from other companies. We're not just epoxy. We're an entire system to help you in your business. We have replacement products for some of the really problematic pro uh, products that you've used in people's kitchens. If you're an experienced epoxy countertop uh, installer. I recommend taking a peek at what we offer here at Counterintelligence. I've been doing this stuff for 17 years and some of the things that we've been able to create and come up with at Counterintelligence would have helped me tremendously throughout my career. So we're not just epoxy. We have an entire system and a very nice franchise opportunity. It's very franchisee friendly. Um, it's just an opportunity for you to take your business to another level. So check us out. Go to countereye.com. That's counter, the letter I, dot com, and you'll find out all the information that you need on the franchise opportunities. So the white looked like it almost completely disappeared as we worked it in with the stick, but now it's floating back to the surface. And you can see a lot of nice graining in here. This actually is a nice, a natural grain effect if you leave it just like this and that's always our go at counterintelligence uh, I can teach you how to make anything you want I can teach you how to make your epoxy look like flames I can teach you how to make it look like a galaxy or anything that you want but our primary goal at counterintelligence we teach five techniques to our franchisees on their initial training and with those five techniques you can replicate just about any type of natural stone that you can come across or wood that you can come across so now I'm going to show you another addition that you can make to this technique. You have an option here on whether to spray this again with isopropyl before this technique. Uh, personally, I don't like to as long as the epoxy hasn't been down too long. Like this has only been down a few minutes. It's taken us maybe 10, 15 minutes to do this sample after all the times that we stop and talk about other things. But um, the Bondo blade I like to use a smaller Bondo blade. This is a four inch blade. Um, if you use too big of a, a blade, it creates a wider pattern and it just doesn't look as natural. Um, so a, a narrower Bondo blade is best for this technique. So with this technique, we're gonna take our Bondo blade and we're gonna hold it at a very shallow angle. And we're literally just gonna skim it across the top. We're not pushing down, we're not trying to move the product at all. And what we want, as this epoxy is not perfectly level yet, and this blade is not perfectly level straight across, as we skim this across the top, it's going to flatten some of this grain and it's going to skip over some of this grain. 
So everywhere it flattens it, it's going to soften that grain, and everywhere that it misses is going to be a very cool, um, just bold looking spot into the finished product. There we go. So you can see right there in the middle, it's kind of skipping over that section right there. So now this is going to be a much softer grain when we're done. And then everywhere that it's skipped over is going to be much more defined as far as the color inside of it. It's a very cool effect. We're just going to repeat that process. Again, I'm not trying to be perfectly straight. But I don't want to be crazy uh, crooked or wavy. I've already, I'm not really moving the epoxy enough to change the way the colors are laying in here. So I don't, I don't need to create new character or new lines. I'm just flattening out and softening up some of the lines in the piece. And other lines are staying put. So now you can see, this is going to continue to move as the epoxy cures, but you can see just how much we softened the grain in a lot of sections, but we skipped over several sections as well, and that's really just the, the natural effect of the blade itself and the imperfectness of the blade. Um, but as this cures, you're just going to see a really hard definition uh, between the areas that the Bondo blade flattened out and the areas that it didn't. So it just creates a different effect and a different look. This is just another way to extend the wood grain effect. So some customers are going to like it better the first way. Some customers are going to like it better this way. Some color combinations are going to work better like this. Some color combinations are going to work better the, the first wood, uh, the wood effect that we did. So it's just going to be trial and error on your part with the color combinations that you want and the interactions that you have with your customers at home. So as always, we'll see you on the next one.